Welcome to the Bloomberg Markets Podcast. I'm Paul Sweeney, alongside my co-host, Matt Miller. Every business day, we bring you interviews from CEOs, market pros, and Bloomberg experts, along with essential market-moving news. Find the Bloomberg Markets Podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts and at Bloomberg.com slash podcast. Now, Matt, we're going to get some s- smart conversation about Treasury refunding, Federal Reserve, all that kind of stuff. We can do that with Campbell Harvey. He's a professor of finance at the Fuqua School of Business at Duke University, my former professor, and I can vouch that I did pass his futures and options class. I, I can't say I did more than pass, but pass is good enough back in the day. Uh, hey, Cam, thanks so much for joining us here. Um, Matt really wants to get smart on this Treasury refunding today. What are your takeaways from what they announced? So... I think we need to look kind of beyond the refunding that was announced and just in general. Um, so so right now, the amount of debt service is about $630 billion mm-hmm. uh, a year. And the average interest rate on that is 2.8%. Okay, so um, we know that rates are like 4.8% or 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 up into the fives with the the short term. So it's reasonable to assume that uh, given the needs and given the uh, $2 trillion uh, deficit, that the debt service will explode. Uh, Indeed, uh, it will in 2024 be the second largest spending category. Right now, again, it's $230 uh, billion a year and that will will definitely go up uh to probably 900 uh over the next year just just the deficit what, alone, 900 billion dollars that's going to be the interest costs yeah so right now it's 630 <gasps> a trillion dollars a year that, in interest costs that is insane yeah. <laughs> i mean exactly. we It'll, talk about big numbers uh professor all the time here but that's just bonkers i mean uh, didn't yeah. like Treasury understand what was happening why, why, when we were at zero? Why didn't they just put out hundred year bonds like the Austrians? <laughs> well, you know, I advocated that uh, take advantage of of these super low rates, and obviously, when you do that, the rates go up. Uh, but but still, it was not normal to have one percent uh, rate on a ten year uh, Treasury. Uh, given what inflation was, we hit one so, percent so on the in, on the thirty year in twenty twenty. Yeah. <laughs> so again, uh, you could argue you should take advantage of that, but look, the problem is a structural problem. So when we have reasonably good growth uh, and a two a trillion dollar uh, deficit, you know that that's a big problem. Mm. And uh, again, that so the the, uh, the 630 is cal- carefully calculated. So, um, for example, we need to be careful with the Fed balance sheet and, and stuff like that, uh, which is kind of left pocket to right pocket for the government. But uh, if you carefully calculate it, it's about $630 um, billion, and that's at 2.8%. It's reasonable to expect that rate will go up um, and when it goes up, it'll be the second largest spending category, just paying interest. That That is not a good situation. Not, yep. And especially if we have slower growth. So we had a great print, and this is kind of consumers running down their savings. And if you look at kind of the leading data, you can see that those savings are pretty well depleted. The consumer is not going to bail out uh, the economy in 2024 like it did in 2023. Hey, Cam, when we hear from the Fed Chairman Jay Powell this afternoon, he's probably going to come out with the language that, as it relates to inflation, we have a long way to go to, to defeat inflation. Do you buy that? No. And and we've talked about this before. So if you calculate the inflation rate uh, with kind of real-time prices for uh, housing and rents, the inflation rate is below 2%. Really, the only reason it's above three is we've got the lagged effect from rental and housing inflation that happened last year. So in real time, we're below two percent. I have no idea what they're talking about. And making policy based upon data from last year uh, that doesn't make any sense. You make policy 
based upon data today and what you anticipate will happen uh, in the future. Isn't it frustrating to watch this happen? I mean, if you advocated for, you know, longer term debt when we were at um, zero interest rate policy, I can't imagine who would push back against that. Why would the Treasury Secretary not do that? And then if you think the Fed is uh, using, you know, clearly bad data in order to drive policy, that should, I imagine, annoy you too. Like, is it, is it difficult to move around in this world? <laughs> Yeah, I think annoying is the right word. Uh, this is not rocket science. You just look at the data. Uh, it's very clear uh, what's happening, uh, especially with the, the housing inflation. So the housing inflation, if you believe the CPI, is running at a rate over 7% year over year. And that just doesn't square with the data. It doesn't square with a year over year rents. It doesn't square with year over year housing prices. It's because it's reflecting what happened last year. So, so I think that there is a problem. We need to use data that is real time data. Uh, you know, housing inflation is not over 7%. And that is the reason most of the print that we get, the, the prints that have been over 3% is being driven by stale data on housing. And that just doesn't seem right. And also, we've seen the long rates um, increase pretty dramatically. Uh, and this is uh, kind of flattening uh, the yield curve, uh, but in a very bad way. So, so usually what happens um, uh, before kind of recessions, um, that you get a yield curve inversion, where the long rates are, are below the short rates. Uh, but then uh, it becomes normal, and usually what happens is that uh, the the short rates decrease to cause the normal yield curve. That's not what we're seeing. We're seeing the long rates go up. That's very bad. That increases the cost of capital, and and that serves to slow the economy. So this is this is not a good situation in in any dimension and right. don't be fooled by that uh, gdp print yep so does is a risk here professor that the fed is overdoing it and will in fact push us into recession gdp will fall off a cliff plus our interest payments are ballooning yeah. at a level that's going to make it hard to invest in things like solving diseases and funding the military that's not not bueno so is that the recession yeah. risk yeah so uh the fed should have stood down in January of this year. So I I agree that they've made things worse. And it's especially bad given what we've seen happen to the long-term rate. That ripples through. Um, and and just think of you know these these firms with commercial real estate loans and things like that where that market is already cratered and and what's going to happen. So we saw kind of a mini banking crisis in March, and then it's hush hush. Well, I'd like to see what's going to happen in the next uh, few months, uh, because we're not going to have four plus uh, GDP growth. Uh, that uh, consumer spending has been depleted. Mm. Savings have been drawn down. And on the investment side, we've already seen that uh, decrease in 2023. So, yeah. so I do believe that the Fed has overdone it unnecessarily okay. uh, shot themselves in the foot and the economy oh at the same time. All right, Cam, thanks so much for joining us. A uh, bunch of us, class of 91, we're coming down to Fuqua next weekend, so watch out. Cam Harvey, professor of finance, the Fuqua School of Business at Duke University. I can vouch he has no basketball game, but he's a genius on the world of finance and economics and all that kind of stuff. You're listening to The Team. Catch our live program, Bloomberg Markets, weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, and the Bloomberg Business app. Or listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts. Jen Reed joins us here. George Ferguson joins us uh, uh, via uh, the Princeton office, the camera there. Why we have Jen Reed and George Ferguson here together. They're from Bloomberg Intelligence. Because we want to talk about Spirit and JetBlue. Those airlines are trying to to merge or one by the other. Matt doesn't believe in mergers. One is buying the other. Obviously, JetBlue is trying to buy Spirit. But the yes. Department of Justice is saying, whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah. Uh, 
George, he follows the airlines for Bloomberg Intelligence. Jen follows all the antitrust stuff for Bloomberg Intelligence. Jen, let's start with you. Sure. Why can't we let these two little itty-bitty airlines get together? <laughs> I mean, it's not United and Delta here. You know, it is exactly the way you look at it. So this is what JetBlue says. We're two little itty-bitty airlines, right? Nationally, we're tiny, maybe 8% combined share. But from an antitrust perspective, that isn't how you look at it. When you look at the way antitrust might impact a consumer, you look at it from a consumer's viewpoint. So when you're looking at it, you don't look at airlines nationally. You look at them city to city. You look at routes that consumers buy to travel, right? And if you reduce the options in a route from, let's say, New York to Los Angeles, a consumer can't choose some different route because the prices went up. Mm. So you're looking route to route, much more narrowly. And in route to route, this is a different kind of merger than the way you'd look at it nationally. Hey, George, how important is this merger for either of these companies if it doesn't happen? I, I don't know, right? Uh, <clears throat> I guess we'll see, right? Because uh, uh, right now, both these companies are losing losing money. Um, so clearly, I think the fares that Jen's concerned about, uh, they aren't enough to support even profitability. Uh, and I think that uh, the JetBlue CEO is going to have to figure out soon how bad he really wants uh, Spirit Airlines because uh, he's going to have to raise three and a half, four billion dollars to buy it. Wow. at interest rates that are probably going to be above uh, 8%. Uh, and again, in a marketplace, it looks like it has too much capacity uh, and fares can't support profitability. Hang, hang on, I assumed that JetBlue had that money stashed aside already. Aren't they? No? I don't see it, sta I don't see it stashed in the balance sheet. <laughs> okay. No. I, the other <laughs> thing I... Go find it. They, the, they may not need it, George. <laughs> the other thing I wonder about is, you know, JetBlue yesterday, George, said... Um, there's basically a dearth of, of travelers, or said differently in the airline industry, there are way too many empty seats in the domestic uh, US. But then somebody tweeted at me the TSA checkpoint travel numbers, and it looks pretty pretty healthy to me. I mean, we're uh, last week we had 2.3 million, the week before that 2.5 million, much better than we had in 2022 or 2021 or 2020. It's, it's basically up there with 2019. So I would say you can't always judge airline health by numbers, right? So in the new world of uh, airline revenue management, uh, you know, load factors, we're seeing 85, 90%, right? These are really high load factors. Those revenue managers, they don't let an airplane go down the runway without <laughs> it being almost full. The, the, the secret though, is you got to get people to pay the price that's going to cover the cost at the airline. And what we're seeing right now in the marketplace is that the low end is that you know that that consumer that that may not be as well healed uh they uh they're seeing softness and their fares are going down we saw yields at JetBlue fall a 13 percent since the year prior right so that's not i mean that's not a healthy environment so jen when does this trial start you're going to go go to this trial yes. right? you're going to attend this trial yes. where is it when is it and what do you expect so it's in boston it started yesterday okay i've reviewed that transcript from yesterday which was mostly opening statements i'm heading out today i'll be there the rest of this week and next week um it will go to december 5th non-consecutive days i think we'll probably get a decision in january the judge said he may try to do something by the end of december but that was when the trial was supposed to start in early october so i think january is more likely and i i just have to one comment about what George said. I mean, this judge is concerned, actually, about the health of the airlines, which is unusual in an antitrust case. He has asked not about JetBlue, but actually about Spirit. Can Spirit survive if this merger doesn't go through? And, uh, you know, we're just getting in, but we'll see what the documents look like with respect to Spirit's growth plans. Well, and I was just looking, I mean, George, at George's comment, I went to the FA function for both uh, um, Spirit Airlines and JetBlue. Neither company is making money. Um, what extent historically do the courts think about that kind of stuff? Well, you know, there's a history here. So we've had a lot of consolidation in the airlines, and there's a lot of concern about that from the DOJ, and they're going to be using that to their benefit in trial. But we've also had a lot of bankruptcies, right? And, and bankruptcies yep. aren't good for consumers either. Um, and the judge is going to be looking at that and thinking about that. But the bottom line is the most difficult part about this trial for Spirit and JetBlue is that they themselves they, Spirit, yep. have argued that this is an anti-competitive deal when they preferred Frontier as a buyer ah, and there was a fight. Okay. So these documents have already been admitted by the judge against the objections ah, okay. of the lawyers and they're going to have to explain those away.
Hey, George, if the judge put you on the stand as an expert witness, if, you know, Wall Street analyst, <laughs> would you testify that if these guys don't merge, neither of them's going to make it or one of them's not going to make it? What, what would your forecast be? I guess I would testify that the market clearly appears to be overcapacitized, if that's a word, because <laughs> too much capacity, um, and that it, it needs some rationalization and putting these two together could rationalize that and would improve their potential to create profits. So that's, I would argue and, that. And I will say that the DOJ opened an investigation of the airlines just for saying exactly that, because rationalization in the antitrust world is a bad thing. It means let's reduce demand to increase prices, and uh, antitrust don't doesn't want that. Right. So can't they just say, all right, on a couple of these routes where we're going to overlap or we'd have too much pricing power, we'll just divest these routes? Can't we do that? That's exactly what they're trying to do. And you know what? The judge might accept that. You know, it's, it's, this is just the beginning of trial. It's not a done deal. The judge might say these divestitures are good enough. You go ahead and merge. That's the healthier option. Um, the issue is the DOJ is also concerned about routes where they do not overlap because they believe JetBlue's fares are higher than Spirit's fares in those routes. And it'll take out that lower cost option. I mean, None of this is low cost compared to what I experienced living in Germany for the past six years. <laughs> yeah, you can fly George, the point to point for like $90. Yes. <laughs> uh, and uh, somehow that just keeps going. You know, that's been happening for at least a decade, right? Low cost airlines in Europe. Um, I don't know that, that, the, that the industry it would be good for the industry to have that here. Probably not. But can we get that? So you're asking me that? <laughs> yes, <laughs> George. I mean... Look, I, I think you can. You know, I think that when, when you know, we look at a lot of analysis of these ultra low cost carriers and the low cost carriers uh, and even the full service carriers, when you take all that ancillary cost that they unbundle and try to put back on top of you when you, when you get to the airport and check your bags, blah, 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 the fares aren't a lot different than full service uh, carriers. And so... I think the whole thing is, you know, it's uh, sometimes it's, it seems a little bit bait and switch-ish, right? Because you sign up for a, like a, a 50 or $70 fare, and next thing you know, there's all these added costs. And so I, I think that we, we can have the industry because they are getting fares that, again, are probably as good as uh, some of the big full service carriers. What, what I will say, though, there, there's an extraordinary challenge, I think, in the U.S., and that is that we just gave away some really large pay yep. increases yep. to the pilots. Mm -hmm. And what you didn't see under that pilot headline was that everyone else got pay increases too. The flight attendants are looking for theirs. Yep. But line maintenance, all those folks have gotten increases. That's going to drive up the average cost right. of fares, right? Mm -hmm. yep. And when you drive up the price of something, less needs to be consumed, right? right? Because, yep. less because you just can't yep. offer as much. So yep. that's, that's one of the major challenges in the U.S. market right now. All right, George, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, George Ferguson covers the airlines for Bloomberg Intelligence and Jen Reese, senior legal analyst, covering the antitrust for Bloomberg Intelligence. You're listening to The Tape. Catch our live program, Bloomberg Markets, weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the TuneIn app, Bloomberg.com, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130 story of the day, and that is interest rates, the Federal Reserve, uh, the U.S. Treasury refunding that balance sheet, all that good stuff. Tim Dewey joins us, Chief U.S. Economist from SGH Macro Advisors. Tim, thanks so much for taking the time here to join us here. What do you expect to hear from uh, our Federal Reserve this afternoon? I think the, the Fed's going to sound very much like uh, we've seen in, in recent comments, particularly in Chairman Powell's uh, speech. Basically, they think that they might have to raise rates uh, again, but they're more and more confident they're near the top peak of the cycle. So uh, I'll ask you the same question I was just asking Tim Fiore. Do you see some kind of cliff here that we're about to fall off? Is there some way that we go into recession, um, you know, in Q4, Q1, you know, Q2 from 5% uh, Q3? 
you know, I, I would be, I would be surprised. Uh, the, the, the reality is, yeah, the, the economy and the GDP almost certainly has to slow from the, the, the third quarter pace. I mean, it was uh, uh, probably doesn't really represent the true underlying pace of the economy. Um, however, there's not really a lot of signs out there that the economy is about to roll over hard, that we're about to walk off a cliff. And so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm still skeptical. We're going to see that certainly in the fourth quarter because we're, we're already in it. Um, but you know, before the the first the second half of next year, um, so trying to try to you know pin down the exact timing of a recession uh, is, is really a, a very very difficult. Well, but um, there seemed to be <laughs> look. Uh, Druckenmiller was on stage with Paul Tudor Jones last week. I mean, that's an all star conference already, Players. right? He says he's <laughs> he says he started to get really nervous. Um, he says he has massive bullish positions in. Um, two-year notes uh, leveraged. So um, he says there's too much risk in the world. And Bill Ackman is saying this a similar thing. Bill Gross was saying something similar. So these big, albeit old names, um, <laughs> are worried about something. What is it? Well, I, I, I honestly don't know um, uh, why the why the enhanced fear. I mean, there's a good reason to think that you're near, you know, you're near peak yields. And so, you know, putting aside any worry about, you know, the, the broader economy, uh, you know, we are at a point where the Fed um, is, is is close to being done high. Even the more it looks like that's that's going to happen traditionally. Uh, long yields eventually fall after that point. So, you know, from a, from a, from a strategic perspective, thinking about this as a peak uh, is, is is certainly not not crazy at all. Um, as far as the, the warning signs, uh, you know, remember a year ago in October, uh, everyone thought the chance of recession in the U.S. economy over the next year was was a hundred percent, and that obviously did not work out that way. So. Um, uh, the world has changed. The world is different. Um, it is, in some sense, riskier. Is it any riskier than it was, you know, during the Cuban Missile Crisis? I don't know about that. <laughs> so, it's interesting, Tim. We just had Cam Harvey on, finance professor at uh, the Fuqua School of Business at Duke. He was really bearish here. He thinks the Fed has gone way, way too far, and he thinks inflation. If you really look at current data, not historical data, inflation is already below two percent. How do you respond to that? Well, uh, so I, I didn't didn't see it in an interview. Um, if you if you look at the um, uh, the, the recent core PC numbers, it's, it's not below two percent yet. So um, I think you know, depending you know what you use as your inflation metric, you probably can find one that's below two percent. He was taking out about, housing. He uh, was taking uh, out rent and home ownership. I think. It's, uh, so yeah, so you, you can strip it down and get to something that's slow. And you know, the, this is a feature of the policy, right? Is that the, the Fed intended to raise interest rates until we got uh, um, interest rates above inflation. They're above inflation. They're waiting for evidence to, to slow the economy to slow. You know, they are seeing that evidence, which is why we've been paused since you know, July here. I will, will, will likely remain paused. So, yeah, has the Fed reached its peak? Have they gone too far? I don't know, because the, one of the one of the counteracting issues here is you know, we've had plenty of fiscal policy to help counteract some of the monetary um, uh, tightening. So I guess I guess the question is, um, if it's higher for longer, how much longer do you think? Uh, uh, um, so funny thing, uh, you usually people say, you know, the Fed's going to cut, you know, roughly six months after the um, uh, first rate, uh, the last rate hike, um, you know, the last rate hike could have been in July, uh, which means by the time of the December meeting, if they don't hike in December, they'll have gone five months without a rate hike. Um, so, you know, the sort of traditional metric would put you in January in a sense. Um, I don't think that that's likely. I don't think they're ready to cut in July. I think the economy will show enough strength that they don't. Um, I do think that they are they are determined to be very confident that inflation is on track to two percent before they cut. Uh, really, what we need to see is a little bit more weakness in 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 the real economy data. What are you watching for? Where are you going to see that weakness? Employment, for yeah, example. So um, that's a great question. Um, if you started to see um, job growth really running below one hundred thousand um, every month, uh, I think that would be a, a, a key a key signal. Um, uh, I think that 
Uh, Which we're not expecting, the, by the way, on Friday. I mean, I'm just looking no, at. No, we're uh, not expecting that on Friday yet. It's just not. It's it's not in the cards. If you look at so look at say the Jolts report this morning, where hiring was basically at pre-pandemic levels, right? And um, puts rate was basically at pre-pandemic levels. Openings was still arguably a little elevated, but not that much different than trend. And the Fed's looking at the same. This is this is a labor market that's more imbalanced, right? You need to see something really trip up investment spending, trip up hiring. Um, and those are the things that generally are precursors to re recession. You need to get firms much, much more pessimistic on the outlook than we're seeing right now. So again, where I see that is, is in the jobs numbers, in the um, initial claims data. Um, I'd expect to see it more in um, uh, durable goods orders uh, than we've seen so far. Are you surprised by this labor market, Tim? I sure am. I, you know, it just we had such a shock to the system, um, and people are concerned about the economy. Even though we had that good three uh, three Q GDP that Matt was mentioning, but it just seems like this market is just incredibly strong. I'm not not really sure why. You know, it's it's a, a bunch of factors. Um, I think people estimated just the the the, the uh, you know the, the underlying strength that or the momentum. That the economy received from uh, uh, the fiscal stimulus and the low monetary, the easy monetary policy, I think that just had bigger legs uh, during the, from the from the pandemic era, era policy than than people anticipated. It just took longer to work some of that through the economy. I think the other thing that, that's out there is that nobody really expected fiscal policy to be such a driving force this late in the cycle. Um, and we've seen deficits expand. Uh, and, and I think that's been a, a real factor that people discounted last year and is really starting to show up this year. Uh, and also, I think fundamentally people underestimate the resilience of the U.S. economy. Um, you know, we we talk a lot more about recessions than we actually have recessions. All right, Tim, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, as always, appreciate getting your thoughts. Tim Dewey, Chief U.S. Economist for SGH Macro Advisors. You're listening to The Tape. Catch our live program, Bloomberg Markets, weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the TuneIn app, Bloomberg.com, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. It is Fed Day. I'm going to talk to Chris Whalen. He's the chairman of Whalen Global Advisors. Hey, Chris, I'd love to get your thoughts on what you think the Fed should do and why. Well, I think they should stop hiking Fed funds rate before we break something. We're pretty close to that point now. And I think they need to, you know, try and articulate to the public and the policymakers what we can expect going forward. There was a fascinating letter from the mortgage bankers and the home builders and the realtors a couple of weeks ago that said, can you give us some guidance? Because the guidance the Fed gave us before about transitory inflation was clearly wrong. And a lot of companies use that guidance in planning their business. So I think the Fed has to be very careful what they say in the future about inflation and other benchmarks, because people sometimes take them at face value. Well, but they've been saying for a couple of years that they're going to hike rates like we've never yes. seen it before to try and quash inflation. I mean, they've been telling everyone in the market hasn't believed them, um, you know, for two years. Uh, Right. Almost. Well, they've caused a lot of inflation, though. Look at housing. Uh, we're not going to take that back easily. We're going to deflate housing 20, 30 percent. No, we're not going to do that because they, they know that there's a deflationary aspect out there still. And it's called bad debt. You know, when debts go bad, that's when you get deflation. So I think the Fed is, uh, you know, as Craig Torres was saying this morning, uh, they're in risk management mode now. Because I think they know they can't go any higher without really seriously uh, causing something to break in the world of credit. Where do you think, by the way, we're going to see debt go bad? We've been talking all morning with people about high yield, and right. no one is concerned. Uh, spreads are relatively tight. And mm -hmm. the, the answer, they tell us, is that all these companies— you know, we're so much smarter than Janet Yellen. They got all their financing under control when rates were zero, and they're, right. they're in a great situation now. Um, but it seems hard to believe. Well, they're, they're getting the financing done, not necessarily on advantageous terms. Um, they're doing a lot of discount issues, for example, to keep the coupon down. 
but you issue the bonds at eight. Now, when the bonds get redeemed, that's going to hurt. So I think there's a lot of ways people are adjusting to this. But, you know, to be honest, you see the carnage now in commercial, commercial real estate. You know, uh, I think every day you see a headline crossing the screen in commercial. And what you don't see is the other five events. They're private. And you won't see them until they hit the courts. So believe me, there's a lot of destruction going on right now on the commercial side. Uh, and it's uh, it's the opposite of 2008. It's the way I would put it to you. This is not consumer. And you're not seeing it yet in consumer-facing vehicles like FinTech and that sort of thing yet. But, so you, you know, think- as this reprices, you'll see more. Yeah, I want to, you know, that kind of goes... So you think we'll see it in, I guess, one of the areas you think we'll see a break will be in commercial real estate. Is that, do I understand that right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's it's happening now. Okay. I mean, look at it this way. Most banks have 50 cents worth of equity in commercial loans, okay? So that means they'll wipe out the quote-unquote owner, and then they'll end up owning the asset at 50 cents on the dollar. Now, even then, though, they may not be able to sell it because, you know, in a rising rate environment, it's hard to sell assets. And it's hard to sell dead banks. Usually when the FDIC is taking care of dead banks, the Fed's already dropped interest rates. So there's a kind of a synchronization problem right now. Yep. The Fed is trying to address inflation, but we still don't have a recession. I mean, hope prices in New York State are still going up, for Christ's sake. We're the weakest state in the U.S. before COVID in so, terms of pricing. So um, do you expect uh, some big financial names to come under pressure, they're already sitting on hold to maturity portfolios that, are, yeah. you know, are worth far less um, than they'd like us to know. And commercial real estate, we thought was the next shoe to drop. Now it looks like it's falling. Who, who's going to get hurt? It's an earnings problem, Matthew, more than a, a, you know, systemic problem. I don't think the Fed will let it get that far. But the inflationary implications of, say, another bank failure are huge. Because if I can't find another bank to buy the dead bank, I have to liquefy the whole thing, which is why the Fed had to lend the FDIC $200 billion. So, you know, I think that if we see another problem in the credit markets of of size, the Fed's going to have to retreat almost immediately. I think that'd be good for a point on Fed funds. Because you can't deal with problems of credit unless rates have already essentially conceded. You know what I mean? Yeah. If, if people think rates are going up, how do I sell those assets, even at a discount? FDIC will normally give you a 30% discount to create new equity under the asset. But even then, you might have a hard time getting buyers in this environment. So the funny part is, to your point, is there's people out creating and buying assets today at really crazy prices because there's cash on the sidelines. There's a huge amount of cash on the sidelines. And what they're waiting for is a signal that we're done, a real signal. Yeah, we're done raising rates. And uh, it seems like the market feels that way right now. The question is, um, what happens with the economy, you know, in Q4 in 2024? And then does the Fed have to cut rates and not by 50 basis points, but maybe more? I think they're going to try and and keep rates more or less where they are because they realize that volatility has not been helpful for a lot of businesses. And I think they also realize that housing particularly is going to get absolutely crunched in the next 12 months. We're, we're going to take another third of capacity out of residential mortgage lending. And you're also going to see capacity coming out of commercial, too, because there's not much volume. I sit with the loan production team in Cohen in New York. They're not busy right now. And the reason <laughs> is, is that the buy side investors who typically are the cash buyers for commercial loans, hotel loans, that kind of thing, they're on the sidelines too. They're trying to figure out where price and where value is today. And most of them have already filled up their allocations for this year. So they're happy to go into the, you know, the end of the year flat. That's not helpful to people who need to do deals. You know what I mean? Yeah. So well, what is, what is going to happen, today. Chris, to those markets? I mean, um, Lower no volumes. One's, no one's going to want to sell. Price. No one's going to want to sell a, a commercial building if they don't have to at a sixty percent haircut. Nobody if wants to sell it. a residential home, right? right? Because you don't. You're not going to remortgage to get someplace else at eight percent when you're in at three. Well, so how does, is different though? Yeah. These, you remember commercial for the last seventy-five years. The assumption has been that the asset would go up in price, 
and we could just do interest only. And that was very much the style in the commercial real estate business. Now you can't, because when the lender comes to you, if the rent roll is down, the building is worth less. They want equity. You've got to put more cash in to roll the mortgage. That's the difference in the dynamic today. And as the treasury deficit goes up, guess what? The Fed has to hold more cash. And what do they do with that cash, Matthew? They collateralize the treasury bonds, for Christ's sake. Hmm. Makes no <laughs> sense. So it, it makes sense to Sam Bankman Freed, he would get that. It sounds like something <laughs> FTX no, would have done. But listen, they're raising rates already, and we're going to make collateral more dear at a time when we're producing nothing on the mortgage side, by the way. We'll do a trillion and a half this year in new coupons. And treasury issuance will be big. But still, you know, and they're going to be buying back low coupon bonds, too, while we're doing all the rest of this stuff. That's going to be interesting. <laughs> all right, Chris. Uh, as always, really interesting discussion. Chris Whalen, chairman. Breaking the Whalen silence. Breaking the Whalen silence. Which I've heard Tom say that a million times. I'm still not 100% sure what it is. But that's a Tom Keenism. All right, Chris Whalen, chairman, Whalen Global Advisors. Thanks so much for joining us there. Thanks for listening to the Bloomberg Markets Podcast. You can subscribe and listen to interviews at Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast platform you prefer. I'm Matt Miller. I'm on Twitter at MattMiller1973. And I'm Paul Sweeney. I'm on Twitter at PT Sweeney. Before the podcast, you can always catch us worldwide at Bloomberg Radio.